Okay. Awesome. <clears throat> so the document you have, um, did you guys all get that document? It says session 14 with the logo. If you'll open that document up and uh, I'm going to ask Sean, if he'll lead us in prayer and then we'll dive in and talk about business meetings. I got all of your questions. Uh, we're going to try to get to get to those. I'm going to have Sean kind of monitor um, the interaction today and interrupt and, and uh, we'll, we'll try to get to some of those, all those questions. I want to get to all of them, but, but uh, so be rest assured if you don't see them being addressed, we're going to, we're going to get to them. Okay. So Sean, go ahead and ask the Lord to bless us. Yes, sir. Dear God, thank you so much for today, Lord. God, when we think of ministry, oftentimes we think of pulpits and sermons and prayers, but Lord, a lot of times God ministry is in the details here. And Lord, this is a, a session that is so practical, but yet so focused on, on ministry, Lord. If we get this wrong, God, we could steer a church wrong. We could steer a meeting wrong. There could be uh, deacons or board members that, that are, are not elected that, that should be. So God, help us with this meeting, Lord God, as we go into this session preparing in, in this pre-planning in the middle of the, the meeting and post-planning. God, open our hearts and our minds God, it's a lot of content. And so, Lord, let us be able to know that we can come back to this. But, Lord, let our questions be answered today uh, as we just, as you, Lord God, whet our appetite uh, for what it means to really steward an entire church well, Lord God. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So we're going to talk about business meetings. If uh, when you become a pastor, in most cases, although every church governance is different, you will also be the president of the corporation and the chairman of the board. So you kind of wear two hats as a pastor. You have a legal entity as the chairman of the board, which brings a lot of pressure on you, if not to make sure things are done, do them yourself or to delegate and make sure they're being done. Um, and so you are going to be chairing not only board meetings, we talked about that, but you're going to be chairing an annual business meeting. And the biggest mistake you can make is to think that you can wing this and to think that um, uh, that that this is an outdated thing, parliamentary procedure, business meetings, or we don't need them. And and I find that pastors that that kind of have this hidden resentment about annual business meetings, when you dig down deep, it's really their own insecurity that they don't feel comfortable doing it. And so they think. They shouldn't have to do it. Um, there's a lot of reasons why business meetings are, are important and why parliamentary procedure is important. Uh, it helps your organization achieve their purpose. You as an organization, you are a corporation. The state sees your church as a corporation. You have a legal obligation to have a business meeting, to have a board, to report financials and these kinds of things. This is not just someone dreaming this up because they think it's a good idea. You have a legal obligation to do these things. You're going to have to have minutes that record decisions and these kinds of things. So what I want to do is, is walk you through this document. It's only four pages, but I tried to make this document as something you can save and then refer back to it. And it's got a ton of links. And when you click those links, you're going to see customizable Microsoft Word files that you can change for your own. I, I'm, I'm cutting hundreds of hours of your learning curve off. And so those will take you to those documents on my server. Some of you, if you are using Safari, you'll click those links and it might seem like nothing happened. But what happened is outside of what you could see on your screen, that document was downloaded to your download folder automatically. And you'll need to go there and uh, and, and find that and open it up. Okay, so here's what we want to talk about. I, I also linked dad's chapter, Charles Crabtree's chapter on uh, business meetings uh, in the introduction of that document. And you can go back and visit that as often as you need. But we're going to talk and break this down into three parts. Pre-meeting preparation, you know, um, we're going to talk about mid-meeting. In, in other words, while you're chairing what you need to do and then we're going to talk about post meeting follow-up um I, I will say that if you can master chairing a meeting the confidence people have it you will 
you will cut at least half of the conflict you'll have as a pastor. If you, if you, um, you know, parliament, your procedure, business meetings, they respect the rights of everybody, the majority, the minority, and those who aren't even present. And so when people see you doing well, leading an organization through making decisions without chaos, electing officers, having good minutes, their confidence in you increases. This is a great way for you to get leadership coins in your purse, okay? So, and, and like anything else I always say to you guys, great meetings are never the result of what's happening in the meeting. Great meetings are the result of what happened before the meeting ever started. And unfortunately, this is one of those things that you need to prepare anywhere from six to eight weeks before, depending on how, you know, how many elections you have and, and these kinds of things. So today's lesson is heavy loaded front side on preparation. And, and then we're going to, I'm going to try to teach all of you to use a chairman script. Um, don't feel insecure with that. I, I made a, dad taught me to make a script in my early years. I pretty much read the script. I mean, um, and, and you doing that makes sure everything happens when it's supposed to happen. Um, it helped your, your church secretary will love it. Your board secretary, because when you plan out the meeting, 80% of what happens is going to go exactly how you planned it. And you hand them the, that chairman script and the minutes become very easy because they, they, all they have to do is doc, uh, document the results of elections, but they see the order that you did things. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about pre-meeting preparation. Um, you're going to have some lead time for your annual business meeting. And honestly, the biggest, uh, most of the time, the issues that I have to deal with as a superintendent helping churches navigate problems are because of botched up business meetings. I would say half of the stuff that I deal with are things that just, and it's because the pastors put it off to the week before, two weeks before. I, I just talked to a pastor this week. His business meeting is this week. He hasn't even started his nomination process for, for deacons. So I, I, I can promise you that is not going to go well. Um, it's going to feel awkward. People are going to sense that person hasn't prepared. And so preparation is huge. I would say plan eight weeks. I don't want you to think it's eight weeks of hard work, you know, totally distracting you from ministry. It's more the time sensitivity of things that you need. Uh, you need that margin. Um, there are uh, a lot of emergencies in ministry. There is a lot of unexpected interruptions. So when you don't give yourself enough time to plan, those interruptions demand your attention. So that's why I say, give yourself eight weeks. The larger the church that you pastor, the more lead time you will be. Um, high point, we started, you know, about 12 weeks before working on the business meeting because we had a very, um, very, uh, you know, a large board. The nomination process, as you saw, the steps are, were, were you know, there's a lot of steps to that process. Our business meetings, believe it or not, you know, you're looking at a uh, I, th I think I put the audit in there as an example of you guys at the time, you know, $16 million operation. Um, those meetings were an hour and 15 minutes, an hour and 15 minutes. And that had questions, deliberation and everything. But it's the fact that things were sent out beforehand. So people were not consuming time being educated. Okay. So the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to read your bylaws and prepare your call to meeting. So call to meeting is actually a parliamentary phrase. And the reason you need to read your bylaws is so that you know what they require. Um, I read the district bylaws probably twice a month. I'm amazed at how much I either forget or don't notice. When I go back for sectional council, some votes require two thirds, some require a majority, some are a nomination, some have to have ratification. So you reading your bylaws every year is gonna help you write down things you need to remember. It's gonna help you prepare. It's also gonna make you more comfortable with your bylaws so that when you get questions, you've got stuff in your head, you know your bylaws better than anybody else. And that starts by reading them every year. So it's gonna require a certain amount of people to be there to get a quorum, okay? It's gonna require, uh, it's gonna say how long terms are so if you have a board member resign midterm, 
You need to know what's left on that term that has to be filled so that your rotation schedule doesn't get off. Um, you're going to need to know how many votes are required to secure an election. And I, I wish I could tell you they're all the same. They're all different. Some churches have majority. Some churches have a majority of those present. Have a major, Others have a majority of ballots turned in. Some have a majority of actually the membership roster. So you got to read through your bylaws and take note of those things. The call to meeting um, is a parliamentary term to describe the official notification of the annual business meeting. And that usually should always at least be a letter in the mail. There's nothing wrong with on your private Facebook group for your church, posting it there or um, you know, sending it out in an email form. <clears throat> but why is the call to meeting important? You need to make sure the call to meeting states what business is going to take place, okay? Because when you're chairing the meeting, people could say, I want to amend the bylaws. Well, your bylaws require prior notice. So you then you're able to say, you know, very gently and kindly, that motion is out of order. You can't amend the bylaws for that because that is was not in the call to meeting and the, the bylaws require prior notice. So the call to meeting, the reason it, it's important is you're protecting the rights of members who can't even be there. Remember that. It's not like you snooze, you lose. That's, that's not what a deliberative democratic process is about. So if you, you can't do anything that you didn't tell people you were going to address, does that make sense? So you can imagine if you missed a business meeting and you come to church Sunday and they're like, hey, we left the Assemblies of God, we voted. And you're like, what? You know, you never said that. So, so remember, parliamentary procedure protects people's rights. It protects the rights of the majority, the minority, and the absent. And that's important for you, for you to, uh, to remember. It's not that you can't do anything. You just have to let people know. So craft that call to order very carefully, especially if it's a special business meeting. If you were having a special business meeting to buy property, to approve a loan, you want to make sure your call to meeting says the purpose of this meeting is this that way that's all that's in order is whatever that was stated now you will have you will have times that that isn't clear and you may have to make an interpretive decision as a chairperson whether that motion's in order or not but let the call to meeting help you on that okay i have if you click uh there's a an example of a call to meeting there uh, in a Word document that you can customize for yourself. Um, everybody understand any questions about call to meeting and you making sure you read your bylaws um, every single time. Why is that important? Yeah, go ahead. Hey, real quick, is there a common um, time frame, you know, for uh, awareness of the meeting? Like, is it a two week, three week? I mean, obviously read the bylaws because everything's going to be different. But is there a common uh, time frame, typically? There, there usually is, uh, Sean. It's usually in your, in your bylaws. Some bylaws, you know, don't think of that. Um, you know, there's a lot of churches that people that just fancy themselves parliamentarians, and they start cutting and pasting the church bylaws, leaving things out and not realizing it. So, but yes, Sean, that's so important. You have to stick to those, because here's what will happen. If you decide something that meeting someone didn't like and they discover that you sent the call to meeting out late or held the meeting one or two days before that notice in the bylaws, they're going to declare that meeting illegal and they're going to challenge you. OK. And they would be correct. Right. I mean, like that would be anything voted in that meeting. If it didn't follow the bylaws, it would not be. Valid. Yeah. And, and every church has one member that you know they're against it they're against anything and especially when you're purchasing property when you're building buildings when you're refinancing um you know if people don't agree with that they start looking for ways to slow that process down and so you'll need to be by the book be by the book if you if you doubt whether it's whether it is going to meet that deadline or not err on the side of caution great question sean Okay, so uh, call to meeting and uh, bylaws. Start there about eight weeks before. Um, two is, is finalize your, your year-end financial report 
an audit. Not all churches are required to do an audit. Um, I always did an audit, even if the bylaws didn't require it. I love having a third party come in, look at my finances. And um, I have never once in all my years of ministry been even accused of overspending, underspending, carelessness. I attribute all that to me being willing to pony up to eight to 10 grand for an audit. Reviews are a little bit cheaper. They're not as extensive as audits, but you can get a review. Then you have a third party coming in saying, we've sampled receipts, we've looked at their budget, we've read their minutes, we've gone through their numbers, everything adds up. And um, I, I'm a big believer that the board should have direct access to the auditor. Some pastors, they deal with the auditor, then they hand the, the board the auditor report. Um, two years ago, I started this with the presbytery. We have one whole meeting. The auditor comes in and presents the, the audit report to the presbytery before the district ever sees it. They can ask any questions they want. They have the auditor's phone number. They have the auditor's email. Um, be as transparent uh, as you can. So you're probably going to ask, you know, one of you asked, you know, do you require an audit? There's a number of things that may require an audit. Um, some churches in their bylaws, they require an audit. If they require an audit, you cannot get a review. Okay, a review is not an audit. It's similar, but it's not. Um, secondly, is some lending institutions will require you to have an audit. Um, when you get into jumbo loans, I'm saying, you know, 15 to $20 million facility loans, very common for the lender to require an audit of the church. They want to make sure that they get a copy of that audit every year and that their loan is secure. You'll have to agree to that before you get the loan. So it's not like you're forced in after. Um, but jumbo loans, very common. If you finance your facility through bonds, bonds are people loan the church money, investors loan the church money like a bank. Um, and, and they get interest, a certain amount of interest on that. In every case, if you finance through bonds or certificates, your bylaws may not require an, an audit, but the, the administrator or the third party fiduciary that administrates those bonds is going to require that of you. So just know that how you finance will, will determine that. So if you don't have that, you want to get all those financial statements done right after, uh, by, by mid-January, you want those statements. You want your December books closed. You want to score through them and make sure you didn't post expenses to the wrong account. You want corrections made and, uh, and all of that thing. Get that behind you uh, right up front because that's the stuff that will bring out surprises. It used to be back in the day, churches would pass out financial reports and nobody would ask a question. Now, um, you know, finance industry, you all have people in your church, they're accountants, they're auditors for, you know, internal auditors for a company even. You're going to get questions that you don't normally get, and you want to be ready for those, okay? So get those books closed up and, uh, uh, and, and get, all of that, get all of that taken care of before your meeting and present it to your board, okay? Why do you want to present it to the board? Zoom is a great avenue for this. You're, you may say, man, we didn't have any questions in the business meeting. I promise you there were questions you knew nothing about in the hallway of the church, pulling a board member, pulling the treasurer aside. What about this? What about this? Make sure your board is 100% informed so they can represent you in those offline, offline settings and put to rest any concerns that may be invalid. Make sense? <clears throat> yeah. So, Pastor Gene, let me ask this. There's a couple of questions. You addressed them. <clears throat> but, you know, questions about going into detail. Um, I love what you said on, on those answers of give the board all the detail. And then what I'm hearing you say is kind of like maybe find that balance when you go public with everything of, you know, you don't have to go into all the detail, but give enough where you're not going to make yourself problems, where you're not going to cause issues by being secretive. Is that, is that kind of what you're saying? Like find that balance in the general yeah. meeting? It and I learned the hard way, Sean. I made a lot of mistakes in my first lead pastorate in this area. So I was, you know, groomed in ministry in the wake of all those moral failures. Many of you are too young to remember the Jimmy Swaggart, Marvin Gorman, um, 
you know, PTL club, all these financial mismanagement things. So that rocked my world in Bible school. So I made a decision. I was going to be the most transparent leader. And I actually used to publish every salary listing it in the financials, my salary, the youth pastor's salary, and it, it caused a lot of problems. That was a big mistake. That was too much transparency. If you do an audit, if you do an audit, you may want to consider just giving people the audit and not the detailed finance, the financial summary of the general tithe fund. Um, I, I landed at high point somewhere in the middle for a number of reasons. We gave everybody the audit um, beforehand, and we had a summary of, of our accounts. In other words, of every department, what the beginning balance was, disbursements, income, balance forward. And that's, that's all I did. When you're, when you're in a larger church, you have to be really careful that you don't overwhelm people with the magnitude of, of your budgets. Yeah. So a normal home, homeowner doesn't understand, man, you guys are wasting money. You know, you spent $32,000 on electricity. Well, they don't understand that in their home, but you run an 80,000 square foot facility and that's going to be normal. So you want, you want to have this balance of being accountable. Um, so here's how you can navigate that, Sean. You can provide the detail if you want in smaller churches. But I'm telling you, people started feeling like they owned me because they knew what I made. I mean, they knew my salary. They knew my medical. They knew my retirement. And, and I made the mistake of erring too much on the side of transparency that people th started seeing me as an employee. Yeah. Okay. Uh, here's a, here's another instance. We had a youth pastor that we provided a certain amount of money to all the staff for medical. That youth pastor had a horrible way of, of managing their finances. They were always behind on their bills, always needing money. Well, they got so, so upside down personally, they didn't tell us this. They stopped using that $500 a month for medical insurance and started using it for, um, you know, just to, to survive. Well, after a year, they started kind of throwing hints to youth leaders and parents, you know, we don't have medical, we need medical. Someone stood up in the business meeting and made a motion to give the youth pastor medical. Very awkward. I had to say the youth pastor does get money for medical, gets $500 a month for medical. If they don't have it, it's because they chose. That was so embarrassing. That youth pastor ended up being humiliated into leaving, but that was their own fault. They were trying to leverage that to, to make people feel sorry for them that they needed, needed more money. So that's because we listed too much, partly because of that. It's um, always the youth pastor, man. Yeah, I'm sorry, man. I, I uh, Well, back then, I mean, you know, now you hire a kid's pastor first when your church is growing. Right. Back then, it was, you know, your your first hire as a staff was youth pastor. So so one more quick clarification. You know, these guys are going to be starting a, a new church. Maybe they go into a situation that there is no requirement for an audit. You know, I think Chris asked a couple of these questions on the, the list here. There's no requirement for a review. Would you recommend, after a couple of years or whatever, amending the bylaws to require an audit or should we just leave that alone? Uh, what would be your recommendation? Man, that's a great question. I'm a big fan of initiating accountability. Once it's in the bylaws, you got to do it. Right. And, and, you know, it's expensive. I mean, I think high points audit by the time I left was 12 grand a year. Um, you know, for a, a church with that budget, that's not a lot of money, but if I was, a church of 100, that would be a waste of money, in my opinion, to do an audit. You can get around that by, you know, making detailed financials to your board or whatever. So, Sean, I would come out, if I was going to do a review or an audit, I would say, I want this and ask the board to, to do it. Um, one thing I did when I was younger was the board got a financial statement, but our software also let us print out a ledger so you could say hey why was utilities high and it was 30 pages long um, you could go to utilities and see every check that was written my treasurer had 100 percent access to that my vice chairman had 100 percent access so in a sense sean you can kind of do an ongoing audit with your board 
I never called it that. I never wanted them to feel like they were watchdogs, but you can achieve those if you don't have the budget in other ways. Um, I just never wanted ever, I did not sign checks, even at high point, in a rare emergency I did. Um, I required two signatures. We had PO systems. I've explained that all to you guys before, but you, you want to be accountable on those things. So, you know, your board can decide the situation if you pastor a church that had some moral issues or some financial indiscretions, you know, the pendulum's going to swing and you're going to have to a couple years have some extreme accountability that you might not feel comfortable because the situation requires it. Pastor Gene. Okay. Um, do you have to, um, so your accountant does not do the, the audit. You get a separate company to do that. And then is, are there, um, are there Christian companies that do that or just any accounting type of firm can do a, an audit for a church? Any, any, for any account, any auditor, there's a difference between an accountant and an auditor. So, um, but if you're going, if you're in the audit category, there are lots of companies that do that. Gina, you brought up a good point. Your audit will be cheaper if you use a Christian company because they understand church work. Um, they're not gonna have this huge learning curve that you're paying for. Um, you know, that's my biggest gripe with attorneys. They will say they can do anything. And if they've never dealt with it, they bill you while they're learning, you know, so you're paying for them to learn something. So. A Christian company will understand things like missions pledges, okay? If you went to a secular auditing firm, they're going to want to do a curl instead of a cash basis. Cash is you're saying X amount of money came in, X amount left. In the business world, if you're an air conditioning company and I go and put an air conditioning in Gina's house, I bill, that bill becomes income. It's posted as income even though I haven't received it, okay? So a secular company will want you to post your missions pledges as income. You can't do that. I mean, you can't say to people, here's your bill for your, you know, for your, uh, so I'm a stickler. I tell, I've told my boards every time I am not going to accrual. Every, every auditor is going to ask you, they're going to gently try to push you that way. I don't do it because what it does is it makes your church look in the, in the red the entire year until December. And, and uh, so what I like to do is, is pay the auditors to come in and do an audit based on cash, a cash system, not a curl system. If I was a business and I could bill all of our ministers for their tithe, send them a bill and collect the bill and call them and tell them they, they only paid half of it and the accrual would work, but it doesn't work in a church. Make sense? Hey, Pastor Gene. Yeah. Hey, just a question on the, you mentioned a review is not an audit. It, is that, uh, is that something that someone in the network can do a review or is that a third party? Is that, I'm not real familiar with that. Is that something that's paid for or just by the board or how does that work? Oh yeah, it's, it's absolutely paid for. Um, it's kind of, uh, it's, um, it's a downgraded audit. The best way to describe it to you, Jared they don't do all the they don't test all systems and controls so a full audit they're gonna go through and say i want to see gene's travel receipts i want to see gene's reimbursements they're going to go through all a, a sampling of those receipts to see if they're going to say tell us about um, how you reconcile your bank statement every month um, a review they're going to do less of those things and just cover in and out to see if there's any money missing does that make sense yeah, that does um, it. Typically, it, same companies. They'll do either a review or yes. audit. Okay. Auditors are getting smart, though, Jared. It used to be like if an audit was um, eight grand, a review would be, you know, 5,500. Okay. And now they're like, now they're just smart. They're like, yeah, our audit is eight grand and our review is 7,500. So, you know, they, they, they want you to go, okay, just get an audit because. Okay. Uh, people were in the recession years were backing off of full audits because okay. of uh, money was tight. Okay. And what, one more quick question. Maybe you're going to address it later. If speaking of bylaws, if you come into a church and maybe there's outdated bylaws or you almost see, I see on uh, the resource page that you have your sample bylaws there. Say you wanted to get 
a whole new bylaws. Is that yeah. something that would be done? Like we want to accept these new bylaws. That would be the annual business meeting, sending that out and the call to order. Uh, yes. Letting everybody know that you're doing it. And you could just do a full on new bylaws. Yeah. Don't, you know, don't do a cut and paste yeah. where you're, you're trying to take this sentence out of your old one, put exactly. this in, vote the old ones out, vote the new in. Okay. Um, I wish I can tell you that the bylaws that are made available as examples to assemblies guide churches um, from headquarters are good. They're terrible. Mm. Um, if you look, the Roman numerals are off. The numbering is off. Uh, there's absolutely not one scriptural reference for a pastor um, on their responsibilities. So the reason I put the high point bylaws is we spent two years, hired five parliamentarians, three attorneys, insurance to turn it. I mean, those things were so vetted. Um, so I, I tell people start with the high point bylaws, cross out and change what you don't like. Okay. That helps a ton. Thanks. Okay. All right. So you're going to, next thing you're going to do is update your membership roster. And, and this is again, where a lot of mistakes are made because you have these people in limbo you have brother jones who everybody loves and he's in a nursing home he can't come to church he still gives to the church keep brother jones on the roster where you get into your board has to approve the updating of the roster so you want your votes to be 100 percent accurate reflection of existing members so you don't want somebody who left the church two years ago okay if you come in as a new pastor, you want that membership roster updated immediately because you have a different vision than the previous pastor. And if so and so family left the church two years ago, why in the world should they get to come and vote when you have a whole new vision. So uh, the AG uses this phrase that they could transfer membership it's totally inaccurate um, structurally every church in the assemblies of God is autonomous. Okay, um, if Chris is pastoring a church and it's a sovereign AG church, as long as they believe AG doctrine, and as long as they have an AG lead pastor, that's all the assemblies of God requires. Well, look how much Chris's vision might be totally different than mine, and that's okay. So I might, if I can just come in and transfer to Chris's church, and I had a Royal Ranger program, and I'm pushing Chris, we won a Royal Ranger, that might not be Chris's vision. Chris may have a vision to help children uh, on Wednesdays. High Point had kids doing ministry on Wednesdays. We were helping them discover their spiritual gifts. So, you know, back in 2008, we, we ditched Rangers and Missionettes. So we had a, a thing where kids came on Wednesdays and they were exploring their spiritual gifts. And then we would go out into the community and go to nursing homes and different things. So I would have people come in and want to transfer their membership, update your roster update your roster and you're going to have board members that say, oh, they're my friend, they left, let's not hurt their feelings, maybe they'll come back. Great, when they come back, they can go through the membership class, learn about your vision and become a member, but make sure your roster is, is solid. Now in COVID, that's become difficult because we have people who watch every week, give, and they haven't been in church for a year. And those are just decisions you and your board are going to have to navigate uh, when you when you update those. <clears throat> so again, we would present a, a membership roster to the board. It's it's always easier to make something better than create it. So as the leader, step up and make recommendations. I would get a word document, I would cross out with word the name that I thought should be removed. I would add names of people went through membership class, give my board any opportunity to change those, keep those. But man, don't walk into a meeting and go every name down the list to decide that is the biggest waste of time. You make a recommendation to the board and uh, and give the rationale for those. Most of the time they'll follow your lead. And sometimes you may need to reconsider things and that's okay. But that's kind of a given on updating uh, your membership roster, okay? Um, you, when people come to the business meeting, one of the easiest ways to do this is they your membership roster, you make your names on in you have two columns on one column is their name in alphabetic order and the other calls them the lion is a lion in word and we would just use that as our roster. And so when people came to the membership meeting annual business meeting, we would print that out, 
they would find their name and they would sign their name saying they were checked in. They would get a badge. We would let non-members sit in the meeting. They just couldn't participate. So you had a different color name badge. You know, the kind you get at the, at the off supply store. Hi, my name is so. So if you, if membership that year was green, the tellers knew at high point when we were, we would go to the, to the small theater and not use the big auditorium. Everybody that had a green badge got a, got a ballot. Okay. So that will help you at your business meeting, maintaining that roster. Would you even allow a non-member, like they could not speak, they had to sit in a certain section, that you have different rules like that? We, we, did, we did, Sean, not because only the way I would explain the business meeting is so that it makes it easier to pass out ballots. Yeah. Um, now, High Point has since gone to all electronic business meetings. The last three that they've had since I've left have all been Zoom. And I realize that's a whole different, uh, whole di different atmosphere, but yes, we would say so that we know um, everybody with the green name tag, please, please sit towards the front. Sean, there were times I used to um, let people ask questions. Um, I loved questions and, and I would say, you know, if you're here and you're, you're considering high point and you're checking us out and you have a question, as long as they didn't become dilatory, um, I would allow that, but they couldn't vote. And the reason you want to update that roster is you will have people that show up and say, I'm a member and they're not a member. They're not a member. They may think they were a member, but they weren't a member. So you want to be able to document those things. All right. Do most, do most bylaws have an, um, a recommendation or a restriction of what if they're a brand new member, do they need to be member for a six months, a year to do certain things at the business meeting? Sean, like you just brought up a whole hornet's nest and it's a good reason you did. This is why you read your bylaws. Um, I can't stand the AG recommended bylaws. I love the AG. I work for the AG, but so they, they say, um, you know, this clause can never be amended. It'll say in the bylaws and it's the clause about being part of the AG. Well, I, I have no guarantee the AG is going to have doctrinal purity 20, 30 years from now. So, you know, we would change that, but they would say, then another one says, you can't vote on the pastor unless you've been a member for 90 days. You can't show up to a business meeting unless you've been a member for 60 days. And really what it has is I counted a caste system, Sean, of five levels of members. A democratic process is everyone has the same rights. I'm I'm against junior members. I'm against honorary members. Um, you are a member or you are not a member. But Sean, we don't, you know, I had the ability to write our bylaws. You don't always have that. Writing a church bylaw is an honor. It is a once in a ministry lifetime opportunity, similar to a president appointing a Supreme Court justice. It's a great opportunity you should take seriously if you are doing a review. But you got to read them, Sean, because uh, it's not just a standard. Some bylaws have, you know, you can go to the business meeting, but you can't vote for 30 days. You can't, um, some of them say if it's a vote on the pastor, you can't vote for, unless you've been in the church a year. Um, it gets real complicated. So uh, I've seen some compliments. Good, good question. You have to read those. Did I answer that? Okay. The fourth thing you're going to want to do is your deacon vetting. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we introduced you in the board meeting to a vetting process and how to make sure you get people around that table that are qualified in the best that the church has. Um, you know, busyness of a pastor not taking the annual business meeting seriously it is costly because if you're not having a vetting process, you're going to be stuck working with people that are less than qualified. So, so step, get out in front of this, get a vetting process, get a nominating process that suits you, that doesn't violate your bylaws. That whole number four talks about that process. And I have a ton of a board nomination memo you can download, the nomination discussion guides, the nomination evaluation sheet, candidate interview worksheet when you interview candidates. 
initial contact letter, um, even the biographical uh, paragraphs that you give to the members before the meeting. So, you know, please don't make people vote on deacons that you they didn't even know who they were till they walked in the door for the business meeting. You, you're going to if you treat it that way, that's the kind of leaders you're going to get last minute shoot from the hip leaders. Let people see the paragraphs, let them pray about it, let them come with an informed decision. OK, um, I'm just going to kind of Sean, why don't we just open this up to the to questions now, because we've dealt with this in a prior session and there's so many resources for you there on number four. Any questions about the deacon vetting? OK, so the fifth thing you're going to do to prepare is you're going to want to prepare your annual report. And the annual report is the documents that your members need to make informed decisions. Um, please don't hand this out as they walk in the door. I mean, there's nothing wrong with making physical copies available at the meeting. It should not be the first time they see it. You should have this out at least two weeks before the meeting. And so this is, you know, you're going to bind this. You're, I used to make it available to our members. We would email the members. We would not make it available to the uh, to the general public. So you're going to that's where you're going to have a PDF very similar to the dockets that you guys get uh, as part of the cohort. And it's going to have a cover. There's going to be a call to meeting that your letter that you sent in the mail is going to be a copy of that there. You're going to have um, an annual audit report right in it or a financial summary in it, whatever way you decide to go on that. Um, you're going to have your budget for the next year. OK, in there, um, you're going to have uh, your annual business meeting minutes from the prior year. You're going to have those all ready to go proofread. Um, they are not official until the membership votes them. So you got to you got to remember that they have to approve their own minutes. Those minutes belong to the membership. They do not belong to you. OK, so you're going to want to have those in that in that uh, docket. That's going to be on your agenda to approve and then your nomination report. And so, you know, remember, great meetings are great meetings because of what happens before the meeting, not during it. So you look at um, the example I gave you of High Point of a church, you know, with a, a $15 million process, you know, funds coming and going. That meeting was an hour and 15 minutes on the average. Um, that was because people had all this stuff beforehand. Okay. So that's what you're going to want in your annual report. You want to, uh, and Sean, some of these questions we can get to the end if that helps. But if you see any, or you guys have any about the annual report, um, man, let me uh, let me know about that. Okay, let's speak up now, and we'll we'll talk. I thought some of you asked about should the annual report have salaries and should they have detail? Yeah, I was going to ask you that question. I had a couple like quick quick questions on that. Um, how much detail should you go into? Should you post half salaries, your salary? You mentioned a little bit about that earlier, but maybe can you clarify on staff salaries? Yeah. Um, so I, I told you I made some mistakes in the beginning. Where I landed over time is I would err on the side. My board got so much information every month. They actually got um, a check register printed out. If they had any question about a GL, they could go back to that register and say, well, man, why was hus pastoral hospitality high? And they could go back, find that number, and there would be a list of every expense. So I made the decision, Sean, to be overly transparent with my board and give the church summaries. We did not list our salaries. We grouped them. Um, it's really none of the church's business. I mean, if any of them want to tell, want to publish their salaries, I'll publish mine. But um, just because the church has membership does not mean they need to know everything about your life. Okay. Another reason I didn't publish the salaries, Sean, is there are, you know, as you get into church and your church grows, there are some positions that no matter how gifted that person is in that position, the church will always pay X for that. Okay. So when you publish salaries, people that are associated with those ministries, they love these people. And they're like, I want this person, they, they should be making more. So for instance, we heard this a lot for our associate children's pastor and our junior high pastor. 
and and I didn't publish salaries because those were always entry level positions. Um, we're talking thirty thousand dollars a year, and in my mind, it was never going to pay more than that. Um, even if I had an all star rock star junior high pastor, we knew we were going to train them. They were going to leave and go somewhere else, but. But High Point had a certain amount that different positions had, and they were always going to be that amount. When you publish those, then people start assigning value to the job because of the person and not the budget, if that makes sense. That's good. You, you did mention this already. Someone asked about time frame. So about an hour, 15, hour and a half. Is that, is that a typical time frame? Yes, if you've done a ton of work up front. I mean, that's unreasonable. If you haven't, um, then you're going to be at the two and a half hour mark, two hour mark, um, somewhere uh, somewhere around around another, there. Another question was asked on the date. You know, have you experienced, is it better on a Sunday after church for lunch, a Sunday night, a Wednesday night, entire night meeting, an off night? What have you seen that works best for you guys? I've seen pastors do it after Sunday morning and that kind of thing. Um, I never did that. I mean, I liked, you know, this is the one time a year that I got to be with the backbone of the church. I mean, the people that made High Point what it is. These are going to be your membership meetings are going to be the biggest assembly of your tithers all year. It's going to be the biggest uh, assembly of your most committed volunteers all year. I like to do that on a separate night when I had everybody fresh, like a Wednesday evening. Um, and we would go into the, we'd, we'd, you know, have some food out. We'd have some different things, not sitting down at a table, but um, so I liked Wednesday, but you know, you got to choose what's right for you. If you're out in like in rural Colorado or rural Utah, you, people may not be able to drive in on midweek during harvest or whatever it might be. So you've got to adjust. It's good. Okay. One last thing that someone asked you kind of in regards to this um, ways to maybe make it fun. Um, and, and you answered that question. You want to share that answer here publicly, like ways to just make it engaging or more vision. Yeah. I think that, um, you know, remember this is not a potluck. This is a business meeting. So you want to make a business meeting fun. You don't want to make a fun event, a business meeting. Does that make sense? Um, so, but there are ways you can do that. I used to, every business meeting has laws, um, where you're waiting on ballots, you're waiting. And I always, before that meeting came up with a list of 10 amazing things that happened that year. And, um, Sean, you've seen me do this with our business meetings and I'll, I'll say, Sean, I want you to be able to report on that. I may ask you, I may not. Um, I think as a chairman, the more comfortable you become with parliamentary procedure, the more you can have fun at the chair, you can be light and crack jokes and these kind of things to keep to keep uh, things moving uh, moving along. Um, but you can uh, you can make it friendly when you come in. If it's a cold day, have hot chocolate. We've done that. Hey, come early for the business meeting. We're going to have apple cider and and this or that. But um, my philosophy is make a business meeting fun. Don't have a fun event that you try to make a business meeting at the same time. Okay. Did I answer that for you? Okay. So the chairman script, man, um, this is it right here. Number six is probably going to be the most determinant thing of the success of your business meeting and as your skill as, as a leader. Okay. So, uh, dad taught me this. Um, I would write out word for word a chairman script every year and um, it gave me peace. I knew what I was supposed to say. I knew when I was supposed to say it. I knew who I was supposed to thank. I knew what votes needed for different things. So on your notes on six, I want you to click the link so it comes up on your screen. I'm not going to spend, you know, a, a, a ton of time on this, but um, I do want to cover it because I think this kind of discipline is is huge. Okay, so uh, do you guys have that opened up on your screen? And I'm going to share my screen, and you tell me what you see right now. Yeah, we see the the insert your church name here. Okay, 
So I put this uh, for you guys so that you can cut and paste. Um, man, I've saved you guys about 30 hours right here, okay? So save this. So you can see you're going to want to go up before the microphone, before your meeting even starts. You're going to say the thing Sean said, hey, to help the tellers distribute uh, ballots, can we have the members sit in this area? Did everyone remember to sign in? Because you can't vote unless you get that colored badge. We're going to start right on time. You tell everybody that. I usually made that announcement twice, about 15 minutes before and about five minutes before. You have to officially call the meeting to order. Um, I liked to give a purpose of the meeting. We're going to give a full report. We're going to conduct elections. We're going to build faith. That's why we're here today. Okay. Then I would go to prayer. You can see I scripted out the scripture I wanted to read. I usually would pick someone in the congregation who was revered as a, as a statesman in the faith that was not up for election. These people were usually senior adults that just everybody respected. I might even ask them to pray after I read the scripture, okay? Then I would go to informal guidelines. And, um, and this, this is so important because you're telling everybody up front how, how we're going to do. We want them to know, hey, we want you to feel free to ask questions, but we may not know if your opinion's right, but we'll know if your attitude's right. And you want it, people to feel the strength of a chairman that is not going to tolerate disorder. I'm not saying you come off mean or autocratic, but you're sending signals right up front. This is, let me give you some advice that we could follow to have a good meeting. I would talk very briefly about attitude, how discussion should take place. Um, I was in a church business meeting a couple months ago, uh, not chairing it, but they had asked me to be there. It fell apart. Uh, someone stood up. Robert's Rules of Order says every comment is made to and through the chair. If I don't like Sean's report, I don't turn at the microphone and look at Sean and talk to Sean. I look at the chairman. And there are times the chairman, I will stop someone and say, excuse me, uh, it's inappropriate for you to address other members here. All your statements should be made to and through the chair. That keeps things from getting heated and personal, okay? I tell them I'm going to be using Robert's Rules informally. And I tell them how I want them to handle if they have a question. Don't just stick your hand up and yell from the back of the room. You stand up, you go to a microphone in the aisle, and you ask to be recognized. You don't just start talking. Parliamentary procedure is you seek to be recognized by the chair. Once the chair recognizes you, then you can ask your question or your statement. Okay. Um, I would go through and the teller committee and the roster committee, we're going to talk about those. I would thank those people and ask for a motion approving those people to serve the, in the business meeting. Then I move right to a roster report. Why do you need to do a roster report right then? A roster report is when your roster committee says, we have 118 members here tonight, they've signed in. You know that you know that's a quorum. So you have the roster report given, you ask a motion to receive the roster report, you document in your minutes that you had a quorum to start that meeting. It's legal to start this meeting and for us to make decisions on behalf of the organization. The next thing is the minutes. Um, we would send them out beforehand um, and I would we would not read them. I would say you had the minutes beforehand. Are there any corrections or additions to the minutes? And if, if I didn't hear anything, I'd say hearing none, the chair's gonna assume that there's none. A motion would be in order to receive the minutes. Would someone be willing to make that motion? Okay. One of the things that helps you keep a business meeting going is the chairman really shouldn't make motions, um, but the chairman can ask for motions. Another thing you can do is if you say, you know, um, are there any questions? And if it's dead silent for five seconds, you say the chair does not see any questions. We're going to move on. And unless you're challenged, you can do that. So, so you can keep the meet the meeting moving by knowing how to entertain motions and to assume that the that you understand the desires or the will of uh, of those present okay by saying you have to say that in the opinion of the chair there are not any questions we're going to move on okay uh, no one's making any changes to the minutes so uh, a motion would be in order to receive them will someone make that motion asking for motions 
um, really speeds things along in a business meeting. Um, so I would do another roster report. You don't have to. I always like to do roster reports right before elections. So people would, uh, would know how many people are registered and you give them instruction. You always read the qualifications of any office you're voting from. You read it right from your bylaws. If you're voting on the pastor, you shouldn't be chairing it, but someone else should, they should read those qualifications. If you're voting on a deacon, they should read those qualifications. Okay. Here's where I told you guys uh, on page six, the bottom page six, I would summarize very quickly the eight stages of our nomination process so that everybody knew the process of how these nominees, you know, were referred to us. Okay. And then we go down to, we explain the terms, the nominees, I'd explain to them how to vote. You're choosing one person, you know, you're choosing one person or your, your vote is yes or no. You know, you explain to them, Robert says blank ballots are considered as scrap paper. I tell people that it helps me get elections done quickly. Um, when you tell them, Hey, you, some people, if they disagree with something or someone, they, they throw in a, they think it's abstaining by throwing in a blank ballot. Robert says a blank ballot is scrap paper. Okay. And you explain those kinds of things to them. Financial report, you could see right there. I'll ask our treasurer to give the financial report. Sometimes the auditor would come. Um, and that was just dependent on me. Uh, in this case, Pat Robinson was uh, a CFO of an oil company. Um, was was in many cases sharper than many auditors, had tremendous trust. So uh, this year, I just had Pat give the report as our treasurer. And, uh, but most years I would have, because we were in the building, different phases of the building program, I would have the auditor come so that people uh, knew the independent auditor was there. I would give my ministry report. Um, I always gave a lay leader of the year report at the business meeting, and this is where we would honor someone we epitomize the kind of volunteer that we need to be a great church. And I would thank those who had served. I would call everyone who was elected the new board to stand behind me. And I would tell the church, I'm giving you my word. I will work with the people that you have given me. Okay. And then we would pray for God's, uh, for God's um, blessing. The, the most awkward part of a business meeting, um, are you guys, yeah, you're not seeing my screen anymore, correct? Okay, is starting well and ending well. Okay, um, there's always this awkwardness with business meetings at the end. People are like, um, um. So what you say is, hey, there's no more further business to cut. There's no more uh, further business to cover. Um, uh, in the opinion of the chair, we're ready to adjourn. Is someone willing to make that motion? Move, second. I'd say all in favor, stand. Get everybody to their feet. Do a standing vote. And that's a great way to uh, to end the meeting. Okay, so uh, on that script, let's talk about that and and have any questions. I would write things in the margin to remind me. I would think through. Um, you know, as some of your deacons get older, they're going to start getting less and less votes. We would have flowers ready if there was a potential that someone was going to not get returned to office but was deeply respected. We wanted to honor them. Um, I would write in as we'd gone through the meeting on my notes who got elected so that when I got to the end of the meeting, I could call them out by name and, uh, and congratulate them. Let's kind of deal with, uh, uh, with any, kind of, uh, any kind of questions that we may have, okay? So we'll open it up for questions. If you don't, if you don't realize what you just saw, it was like the holy script, man, <laughs> the holy grail. Like, I, I hope that you realize how valuable that kind of document is. It answers a bunch of questions. I think a few guys had wrote, you know, in the questions ahead of time, you know, do I have to use the same terminology? Do I have to use certain things and procedure? The answer is yes. And, and this document is what helps you. You don't have to guess. You don't have to wonder. You can write those words exactly and, and read it, you know, feel free to read it from this script, you see many chairmen looking at books and notes and things. So this is common. This is not a sermon. Uh, yes. Man, this is something that you're able to just utilize. And, and I love even putting potential things. I, I saw one in the past, I think that Pastor Gene had 
of, hey, this could be a question uh, that will be asked. What will my response be? That question may never be asked, but you better be ready for those responses. And even what he just mentioned, if there was someone potentially that might get voted off, uh, hey, we've got a gift ready. <laughs> you know, we're not throwing them a surprise retirement party, but we're ready and we're prepared. And this script helps with that. Um, another question I think that that Scott asked about, you know, how much control do I have as the chairman or how do I balance that? I love what Pastor Gene said, you're steering, you're not controlling, you're moving things along, you're not forcing. And man, the, the power of a pause, uh, a too long of a pause, and there may be crazy questions come up, but I love, I've, I've watched it happen where it's like, do we have any questions? You give that time, the chair seeing that there's no questions being asked, we're going to move forward. And, and so again, you're not controlling, you're not forcing, but you're moving things along, saying things like the chair is willing to recognize a question or the chair is willing to, to take a motion right here. Those kind of things help. And I've watched it happen. I've watched that meeting move along so quickly and so orderly without people feeling um, you know, like they're being rushed. Because there's another statement that I've watched Pastor Gene say right before a vote, uh, he would say, does everyone understand exactly what we're voting on? Give that opportunity for questions. All right. Seeing that there's no questions, we're ready to vote. And then we pray and, and, and move forward. So, all right. Anybody have any questions on this uh, document? I think it, uh, it answered my question because I thought it was really helpful because I, I'm more of a like spirit of the law kind of guy where it's kind of like just because I when I was a police officer, just because you can give someone a ticket doesn't mean you do, you know, or just as a pastor, just because you can hammer them with the word doesn't mean you do. And so, but this is very much so like, I liked how it was like a, it's a legal process. And so I'm sitting in my head saying, I'm going to have to script this. And then Gene goes, here's the script. And I'm like, thank you. <laughs> so that was perfect. Thank you for that. Cause I, this is probably where I'm the weakest. And in my head, I'm like, I'm going to have to script everything. And you gave it to me. So thank you. And, and Isaac, I think the thing is everybody's different. So you can write that script how you would, how you would like. Um, I didn't mention in the script in the, in the right hand column, there is a, a, a chart in a box. And those are all the things that you have to do as a chairman to pro the first little list at the top is processing verbal motions. You have to recognize the motion as a chairman. You have to restate the motion. So say Chris says, I move that we uh, purchase the land for $2 million. Then the, I, as the chairman would say, there's a motion on the floor to purchase the land for $2 million. Is there a second for that motion? Okay, now the motion's before us. So you have to, that list reminded me of my obligations as a chairman. And then ballots, the one underneath there is a list of things I had to do. So that's why that little chart is on every page. It, it, every page I had a reminder of what my obligations were as a chairman regarding motions and, and votes. Sean mentioned the script. One of the things I forgot to mention is I always gave the script to my board secretary. Because if I get in a car accident on the way to the business meeting, you know, shame on us, do all this planning. And because I don't show up, we don't have the meeting. That's crazy. So I would always make sure one of my board members had the script. Um, and in my, in my eyes, normally, um, normally the state re only requires two officers, a chairman and a secretary. Some churches have vice chairman and it's a whole nother issue to discuss. But so I always made sure my secretary had a copy of the script when I finished it in case I, I wasn't there, I might've got sick, I might've died, I might've whatever, the church needs to go on, okay? So the script helps you uh, lengthen your leadership pipeline as well. Do we, any other questions, Sean? Gene, I had a couple of questions, if that's okay. Yep. Um, on the roster report, I noticed that the number of members that are there is what reported, that's what's motioned on, and that's what's approved. So it sounds to me like the number is more important than that actually who's there. 
Um, so how important is it that the members actually sign, physically sign something saying they're there at the beginning, or is it, can it be something as just a roster and someone at the door checking off saying, okay, here, he's here, he's here, she's here. Yes, it could be both. I mean, I, I liked people to sign because um, it gave us an opportunity to, um, we always had two people at that desk and, um, and, you know, Scott, you have people that, <laughs> you know, they, they didn't take the membership class or they took the membership class and never turned in the application. So when they realize their name's not on the list, um, then they sometimes, so someone would take them to the side and explain them and say, no, we have a record of the memberships over the years. And, and you took the class on this day. We just had this happen. It's funny you bring this up. High point called us and said, um, someone claims they were in the membership class. Well, Rhonda still had records of that membership class. And they said, yeah, they took the class. They didn't turn in the, the thing. And then that person said, then they said, oh yeah, you know, so that's your call, bro. You could, you could check them off or you could have them recognize they're checking in. All right. It sounds like it's just better safe, it's safer, better safe than sorry when it comes to signing off. My second question, um, and maybe I just wasn't keeping up or whatnot, but when it came to like um, getting ready to vote for a new board member or something, isn't there somewhere in there where we need to like read the job description of the board and, and let people know, is that part of the script or did I miss that? Or I, I would read what's in the bylaws. I mean, I had my own orientation for the board that I would not drag the church through. I required a lot more of my board than the bylaws did, but the bylaws is what we read at the business meeting. Okay. Gene, there's a question in the comments about which parliamentary procedure class would you recommend if you want to learn more? So um, there are classes that the National Association of Parliamentarians provide. They're um, just like we have in the AG three levels of credential, certified, licensed, and ordained. The National Association of Parliamentarians has three levels of parliamentarian. So at one time I was at the highest level to do that. They read us your testing is they read a sentence and you have to find that sentence in three minutes in Robert's rules of order, 700 pages. Well, I just, you know, I just over the years, now I'm the lowest level. I'm like certified. Um, so you can go to them and the lowest level, I would recommend not taking a class yet. I would just become a member of the national association of parliamentarians. And I will throw this out to you guys. <clears throat> if any of you, here's what it's required. You remember the book I bought you, Robert's Rules in Brief, and I sent all you guys a gift, an Amazon gift thing for it. So that book, uh, NAP realizes no one, very few people have the interest to read. A, the, the official Robert's Rules of Order is 700 pages. That's the official manual. The, the one I gave you guys is not official. You can't stand up and say, well, on page so-and-so, but 80% of what you need to know is in that little book. Reading that book and taking an online test is all you need to do to become a member of the National Association of Parliamentarians and get an 80% or higher, okay? I'll throw this out to you guys. I need parliamentarians in the network. If any of you wanna read that book and become a member, that's the lowest level, the member of NAP, I will pay your first year of dues. Okay. So um, that's what I would recommend uh, rather than a class, Nick, just because um, a class is going to, is going to take you, my goodness, 12 weeks where the book gets you all the information you need on your own time. I feel like you were looking at me when you said that. <laughs> I don't know if that was the Holy Spirit or I, what. But. I, I got to tell you guys something. When I was younger, I was much more autocratic. Um, I learned a lot of great things from my mentors, and I learned some bad things from my mentors. Dad's generation, the pastor made all the decisions. The pastor, you know, they, they, were, they were royalty. They were spiritual royalty, you know. And parliamentary procedure taught me how to respect the rights of everyone. It made me a better leader. It also made me um, know how to handle those awkward people in every church that think they're experts and they want to come in and, and throw kinks in business meetings. 
it helped me master and not let those people hijack the situation. So you will be a better leader. I'm going to, I'm going to promise you, those of you, if you read that book, you're not going to fall over in your chair speaking in tongues. Okay. I can promise you it's not going to be a deep spiritual experience, but I can promise you, you will be a better leader because of it. You will know how to make decisions as a, you know, how to build consensus. You know how to, um, can you imagine showing up to a meeting with no parliamentary procedure and everyone's screaming and everyone's, your homeowners associations use parliamentary procedure, your city councils use it, your state legislators use it. It's, it's very beneficial. So I want to throw that out. I will pay, and I think it's, I think it's like a hundred bucks a year. I'll pay it. If you, be, if you pass the test, I will reimburse you for your dues. Hoping someone someone's... asked, where is that test? Is, is there a link? Like you mentioned the organization. Can you give that again? Maybe. Yeah, if you just Google National Association of Parliamentarians, okay. um, you, will, uh, you will find that. All right, thanks. And you already have the book you need. Yep. Okay. Any other questions on, on this mm -hmm. stuff right here? Okay. Well, let's move forward. We got a lot of ground to cover. Um, the, uh, we talked about uh, um, the next item is after the chairman's script, that was the most important thing you're going to learn today is that script, whatever you need to do to make your script, do it, take mine, make it better, do whatever. So the seventh thing to prep is to appoint and train a roster and teller committee. So here's the difference. A roster committee are the people that sign people in. Okay. They're the ones that guarantee that everyone who's in that meeting is a member. All right. So they're going to sit at a table. They're going to sit at something when people walk in. Uh, I used to have uh, two people, one for A through L, I think, and the other one names through M through Z or whoever. Uh, you remember, you could look at your own roster and see where the halfway point is on the alphabet. And, uh, and they would sign people in, hand them a physical copy of what they might have been given electronically if they would like it. And then they're going to, you're going to make one of those people, a third person or one of the two, the chairman, the chairperson, and they're going to bring you the report because sometimes I like to have a roster report before every election. If you've seen me at district council, I like to have a roster report before every election. So people know, wow, you know, how many people have registered? Wow, something's wrong. We had a hundred people register and we had 120 votes. What's going on here? So uh, that, that kind of protects you on that. Now the teller committee, those are the people that are counting the ballots and, and you want to give them process. So man, right there in those download, there's five download links. There's a memo to your roster committee telling them what their job is and how to do it. There's a memo to the teller committee telling them what their job is and how to do it. And then there's resources to help them. There's a template for uh, the roster report that you want to give to them. They fill in the numbers, they hand it to you. And uh, when you're chairing the meeting, and then there's also a, for the tellers that are counting, there's a worksheet. And um, I like to have tellers when they're back, they're counting someone looking over their shoulder and then someone making a hash for every mark that person gets. You could use all of that stuff, but you want to get those people appointed. And then before the meeting, an hour before I had a quick meeting with them, but giving them the memo explains their job, what they need to do. Any questions on that? So quickly, because we've gone through COVID and we've done Zoom elections, that's something that even the network's going to, do you recommend that as a church or like, what are your recommendations on electronic voting? Man, Sean, that's a great question. And I, I, uh, I love it, by the way. I loved our district council that we had on Zoom. You got to be careful um, if you if you're not if you don't pay a higher subscription to Zoom. You most of these online apps give you percentages, and percentages don't always work. If it's a super close vote, you need to know the exact number of yes and no. So Zoom doesn't offer that until you go to the webinar level. Um, otherwise, they just give you a percentage. Those of you that were general counsel, you saw how the council made a critical error, a motion was ruled that it passed when it actually didn't have enough votes. It wasn't a majority. But what Zoom, with the software did is it rounded up as you, as common. So instead of it being, it was 50 point, 
nine. So the software told the chairman or super general soup, it passed by 51%, but the software rounded it up. Well, someone caught that because they gave a roster report and called it out. I missed it and I was the parliamentarian. So you want whatever you use online, you want it to tell you the numbers, Sean. I have a question, Pastor Gene, regarding the roster committee and uh, teller committee and chairpers or um, like, like at our church, we tend to use either staff members or uh, deacon team members and their wives. Yeah. Is that a good practice? Yeah. I wouldn't steer away from that. I wouldn't use staff just because in people's mind, uh, Rob, they see staff as your liaisons, you know? And so, um, but I would use deacons and their spouses if, if they were not being voted on. If you were being voted on, um, if you were on that nominating ballot for anything, I did not use you uh, in, that, um, in that meeting. I would wait until you were into your term and not being elected. Great questions though. Thank you. Any others? Pastor. Um, I want to go back to the signing sheet. Um, I'm a signing sheet person besides a head count uh, because there's been times that I've had to go back and just look at who was there. Um, and so I'm, I'm assuming that the signing sheet may help the roster committee if they need just uh, as people are coming in and they're signing their name, but maybe something is being given out to them. They can just look down the line and see, okay, this person signed. That means we gave them these forms or whatever. Um, it's just a, an assumption there. Yeah, I love that. I'm the same way. And my roster team, where they got the numbers to write down on the paper were from that sign-in sheet. That's where they, they got the numbers from, okay? Okay, let's talk a little bit. Uh, the next ones are real quick, and then uh, the meeting, we're, we're doing great on our timing here. The next thing you want to do, we're still in pre-mode. Don't worry. That's most of our time today is in pre-mode. Um, brief your board on the agenda and assign tasks. Um, I'm a big fan of keeping my board informed. Okay. Um, they can help you out there. Okay. There's been times that, um, you know, my board members are right there for me. I'll say that, you know, a motion would be in order to do this. And one of them speak up and say, I move. They, they want to help me get this meeting moving along. And you don't want them to wonder, well, does pastor want me to do this or that? Or, and so I would brief them on the agenda where we're going uh, on those kinds of things. Um, when my son was sick, when Gina was sick, um, I actually sent my script to the entire board that year and in email and said, uh, man, if something happens with Gino and I don't show up, uh, you guys, all of you will know the plan and you can help each other to get that, to get that done. So you're going to want to brief them on the agenda. A uh, nine is you're going to want a point and a coordinator. This isn't so much needed when you're pastoring smaller churches, but when you get into larger churches, um, you're going to have lots of needs come up. You cannot leave the chairman's post. Do not relinquish that chair in a meeting. If someone has an announcement, you have another microphone off to the side. You do not let people take your place as a chairman. That's Robert's rules of order, okay? Unless you are relinquishing the chair because of a conflict of interest for you. But if Sister Jones wants to come up and give a women's report, she does not do it from the chairman's post. She does it from a microphone off, off to the side. So you're at the post, which means you can't leave and say, what's taking the, what's taking the teller committee so long? Or, you know, what's, uh, we need, we, there was an election, we're going to run out of ballots, we need to have ballots in the pipeline. So a coordinator's job is to watch you to help you to do anything while the meetings happening. The larger your church is people are going to be coming up to you beforehand talking to you talking to you after. So you're not going to be as accessible uh, as you'd like to be so get a coordinator to help you with those kind of things. And the last is uh, number 10 is what I say prepare um, inspirational testimonies. Uh, sit down, write 10 amazing things that have happened. Um, I would even tell some people, hey, I'm going to ask you to talk about how many kids got saved at the Colfax campus uh, this past year. Can you be ready if I call you? And I just had that list next to me on the podium. And, uh, and at any time I died, said if I felt like the meeting needed a 
pick me up, I'd say, hey, let's have uh, Pastor Marcella come up here. Marcella, uh, I hear that 20 kids, uh, homeless kids got saved. Tell us how that happened. And just those quick little things that just invigorate a meeting. So, but you got to tell everybody, I may not be able to call you, but just be ready because you can't go through that. You know, if your meeting has time, well, it's great to do it. If not, uh, then don't. So that's the last uh, preparation thing. Um, for the meeting, let's move to mid-meeting. Now you're chairing the meeting. We don't need to talk a lot here because you've done your script and you're just gonna walk through that script in the meeting, okay? Um, you may flip around, you may you know, still be electing deacons and why they're counting, you're already here, but you, know, you could slide a piece of paper into the page where you were that you need to return to as you keep going. I'd write notes even in the meeting. Set up your chairman's post, yeah, wherever you're going to be, make sure there's a microphone, make sure you've got your script. Script in a, in a binder is awesome because then your pages don't get out of order as you're flipping around. Uh, you're going to need your membership roster up there. You're going to need minutes from last year. You're going to need a copy of Robert's Rules of Order. You're going to want to put that stuff uh, at your post. We already talked about separating the house. You might say, can I have members in the last four rows and, and or non-members and members up front? Um, you're going to want to provide pens and water and light refreshments, make it fun, um, have printed materials on hand for those that, that didn't have them. And then all you do is you work through your script just carefully, methodically. I love what Sean said. That's, that was some of the best advice you're going to get today. This is not preaching. Don't set your expectations that you're preaching. You're chairing a business meeting. So no one's going to think differently if you, if they see oh wow pastor's reading a lot of this stuff where he's you're you're not up there trying to wax eloquent and have an altar call your job is to have a business meeting that every under, everybody understands what they did why they did it and and that everything was handled appropriately so work through that slowly uh, on that I'll talk in a minute about post meeting stuff um, what do you think Sean do you want me to cover that now and then handle questions all at once at the end or it's let's, not very long. Let's see if anyone has any questions about, you know, I mean, I know, listen, guys, it's a lot. This is so much it stuff. Is. And, and if you click every link, you've probably got a hundred pages of content that Pastor Gene is just handed to you. Um, so, but is there any questions now we're in the meeting and, and, and I, I would say just recommendation, man, I've seen this happen in some smaller churches where, you know, they were like, oh, pastor, we don't need a do this formally, you know, man, there's just get up there and tell us how it is. Listen, don't fall for that trap, you know, um, set with your board, the, the expectation, Hey, we're going to go in here. This is going to be done with excellence and, and professional and, and, and you, you don't have to make it all stuffy. You can, you can chair this meeting correctly, but using your personality, but, but don't fall for that trap of, Oh, I'm just going to, we can, we don't need to do this. We don't have to do this. this is why the script is important. This is why the preparation is important. So, so now we're in the meeting, we're mid meeting, any questions about things that may come up anything that you guys have? I've got one question. If you don't. I do. I have Go ahead, Gina. Okay. I would, do you have a little, um, <clears throat> a little, piece of verbiage that you write down or on a sticky note or something so that if somebody gets up to 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 uh, cause a little distraction or disorder that you can immediately go to so that you can kind of squelch that you know Gino I I don't have a script because it's I mean I again having studied parliamentary procedure formally I have those things in my head and this is why that little you know, 180 page book I gave you guys the it's Robert's rules of order in brief, which is the same organization that produced Robert's rules of order so it's not someone else telling you. Um, as a chairperson there's a number of things that you got to measure is the motion in order. If it's out of order you just tell people it's out of order and why is is the motion um, germane and Roberts teaches you how to define germane in other words. Emotion could be out of order because of the wrong timing. If you're dealing with uh, one issue, someone can't stand up and, and say, uh, I want to amend the motion for this, or I want to make a motion for this. No, you can only have one motion on the floor. 
or that it may not be germane to what you're talking about. Dilatory is another form of motion. And that's kind of what you're talking about. It's a, it's a hostile, mean, um, out of, out of order kind of thing. It's, it's, uh, and you, and it, and you would just make that, that yet motion is out of order or whatever. Um, so that book helps you, Gina, get those phrases that you need, or at least understand them. And to the point you could explain them in your own words. Okay. I have a question, pastor, um, that script. Um, if God forbid something happened to the pastor on the way um, and they hand that script out, would that still be counted as something legal to use at that board meeting, considering the pastor's not there? Yeah, the, the, what you'd have to decide is, um, you know, who's going to chair the meeting. Robert says that the, the, the chairman can relinquish the chair. If he's challenged, then the, the, assembly has to vote whether that's in order or the assembly can can uh, decide who's a chair so what i always told my board is if something happens to me mike moratsky the board secretary he does the minutes um one of you make a motion that mike serve as the interim chair and and it would be that that smooth the the script is not a legal document so the script is my notes it has no authority it's just it's for me and me only matter of fact the minutes until they are approved, or Robert says, are just a secretary's notes. So you don't have to worry about, does, do they have to approve everything on the script? No, that's that's just your notes, okay? That's good. Anybody else? I have one more question. Um, and um, years ago, Pastor, way back in uh, 88, um, I, I was at a church just learning as a baby Christian, but a member already. And uh, as I walked in for the business meeting, uh, uh, someone was handing only certain members uh, some papers that they were going to approach, I guess, the pastor by surprise at that business meeting. Of course, that set a total discord in that business meeting. Um, and a lot of confusion mm -hmm. it was more it was more like a backstabbing that they were doing to the pastor uh that person was taken care of uh the tr the pastor and the deacons had immense wisdom um however yes i always wonder you know what do we do in a case like this where a, uh, the chair or the pastor is taken by surprise with something that is brought up that you know wasn't yeah. planned before but because you just never know who's out there yeah. to to hurt the pastor, you know. Yeah. So l let me just say this as a general word of advice. Uh, Sean has a phrase that he uses that I love. He calls it running to the roar. And uh, basically what he means by that is leaders have to run to the problem, not wait for the problem to come to them. So when these things happen, not all the time, Maria, but in most cases, it's because the church is led by an overly passive person who doesn't deal with problems the week before the business meeting or the month before the business meeting. Um, I have witnessed very difficult business meetings that really the pastor did nothing wrong. There's no way they could have been proactive. But most of the time, I would guess that anyone passing out some information to try to influence the decisions they knew about that person's disgruntled spirit long before uh, that meeting. And so um, you as a leader, I use the phrase in our in our cohort a lot, you have to step on baby alligators before they grow into 20 foot man eaters, because then you got to jump into the swamp and wrestle them, right? Um, so I, I would say being proactive as a as a leader. And I had one occasion, I wouldn't say it was awkward. But um, Sometimes I just give people enough enough slack to to hang themselves to to lose credibility, um, it, especially if everybody knows someone's someone's trying to hint or whatever. You being polite and handling it in a polite way uh, is much better than than being you know overly overly assertive. But you've got to determine uh, at at the at the time. I have never had a negative business meeting. I thank God for that. I attribute that to the pre-planning and the board being totally on board with the agenda and where we're going. Okay. It's unfortunate that situation you said, 
Sean, did I describe your phrase correctly? I uh, yeah. run I to the roar, that. man. I've watched you do that a lot. It's <laughs> awesome, man. And that's a strong leader. And and I think again, back to that whole: you're not forcing something, you're not being a dictator, but you're allowing Robert's rules, you're allowing parliamentary procedure to help you and to guide you through this. And um, yeah, I love that. I I, I think again using that time to slow it down. And that was one of my questions is like, how do we slow down some of the process as you're chairing the board? Sometimes it feels like people are speaking to a motion, but not the amendment or it's, I mean, they're just kind of, they're yes. jumping over things when, Hey, we've got to actually vote on this amendment. We're not voting on the actual motion and they have to write that out and having all these things correctly. I think that kind of stuff slows it down. Any other recommendations on how to how to slow it down to where you're not feeling like you're being pushed. I think knowing the rules is really important. So Sean, one common thing people do um, innocently is they want to read something, you know, um, I have this every year district council. There is a pastor that is passionate about uh, veterans and he wants to read a eight minute thing about veterans. And Robert says that no one can read unless the assembly approves them to read. Could you imagine how long business meetings would meet if Juanita could get up and read her, her favorite thing and Chris could read his and Isaac could read his. So I will stop them and say, I'm sorry, I need to interrupt you. Uh, it's inappropriate for you to read something without the floor's approval. So I'm going to ask you to sit down. At that point, I haven't told that person parliamentary procedure, but they could say, well, then I'd like to ask permission. OK, so I, I tell them it's inappropriate, which is 100 percent accurate and leave it to them to know parliamentary procedure to ask permission to do that. Most cases, your floor does not want to listen to people read long position papers. So things like that, Sean, knowing those rules are important. <clears throat> yeah, let's move on to the post meeting and then we can wrap up. Awesome. So now your meeting's over. You've adjourned. Everybody's mingling around. Where do you go from here? Uh, this is where you can you can really create some problems if you think the meeting's really over, because you have some stuff you got to do. Please do not wait till a month before the business meeting next year to to solidify the minutes. If you have a board secretary, tell them, "Hey, great, I'd like to see the draft of the minutes next week." Um, you will not remember things a year from now. Believe me, I mean, this is a big mistake a lot of churches make as they procrastinate the minutes to the next year. So I always say to my uh, board secretary, hey, I'd like to see a draft of the minutes next week. And then I even put it in the board docket. The board is not authorized to accept the minutes of the business meeting because the members, the minutes belong to them. The group that had the action is the only group that approved them. But it really helps me saying to the board, is this everybody's re recollection? Are we missing anything? And then we have a good draft to bring next year that's proofread, okay? Uh, you want to seal all your documentation, those ballots, those teller reports um, that Maria talked about, your sign-in sheet, uh, your annual report. You want to seal all those in an envelope, put it wherever you put your historical stuff or files for the church. Believe it or not, uh, you know, Robert says you should you don't have to give the person's name for a motion. I I like that. I ask my secretary to do that. If Sean made a motion, I'd ask my secretary to give the number person's name who made the motion and second it. Well, why? Let me give an example. When I came into the district office, we had a ministry enhancement fund that 10% of the tithes were supposed to go to ministry enhancement. I noticed that the district was developing an unhealthy reliance upon this fund for operations. So I went back to the minutes from 20, 30 years ago and found the names of the people who made the motion and called them and said, tell me about the history of this. When you guys set up this ministry enhancement fund, what was it for? Oh, it was for books and training of pastors and these kinds of things. So now because the minutes recorded the name, I was able to go back and discover original intent. And so you wanna be able to do that. And as the chairman, you have every right when you're doing those drafts that I talked about, if you made a motion to approve a $3 million loan at a certain percent interest, 
boy, you want to know who made that motion and who seconded it because 10 years later, someone may have a question. All right. So those are those are things you want to orientate your new your new members. Um, I have an orientation every year and I have my existing presbytery and the new presbytery. So there are presbyters who have been through three ordination meetings with me and that's OK. I like that. I gave you a, a link to the one I use for the presbytery. And this is where you talk about uh, Scott, you mentioned qualifications, duties. You know, um, this is the meeting I talk about the duties that are that wonderful line that says and anything else the superintendent requires, you know, or whatever. But that's where you want to educate them so everybody's on the same page. I gave you a link to my orientation that I use for the presbytery. You want to thank your team, send thank you notes of all those people. Um, you're going to need to shore up some things. Um, you know, some some people when they give the roster report, they don't like to give the votes because they think it hurts people's feelings if they only got one vote. Roberts is so clear about that. Anytime you do a paper ballot, you must give a roster report. You must tell the assembly how many votes each person got. Your job is you're not there to preserve people's feelings. Your job is to make sure things are done right. And so what you don't want is people going, you know, how do we know pastors not stacking the deck? We never hear the, the results of the final vote. How do, how do we know who got on or who didn't? You're also going to have people who might have got their feelings hurt that they weren't elected. I always circle back after the meeting, call those people. Obviously, if they were on the, on the ballot, on the nomination report, they are somewhere in your leadership pipeline. You want to value them. You want to coach them up, affirm them, make sure that they understand the goal is to find God's will. Um, not not to not a popularity contest. There's times people got elected to my board that I'd scratch my head and go, wow, this guy was way more qualified. And lo and behold, three years later, you're dealing with an investment from the church that that one person is uniquely qualified for. God knew exactly <coughs> what he was doing. So uh, I would I would you know fortify the morale. And then uh, I have your last thing in your notes that book that I gave you guys a, a gift certificate for an Amazon. That is a great way to stay uh, connected and sh keep your, your parliamentary skills sharpened for the new year. So uh, as Sean said, there's a, there's a lot here. And why don't we, uh, Sean, you can just kind of take us from here till, till conclusion, see if there's any questions. And if I haven't talked about something that you need, that we need to, we tried to get to all your questions you sent us. Sean has that list. So bring it up now. Yeah, I think one thing too, just to reiterate the sealing and the filing of the documents, you know, that's a, it is a post meeting action, but it's a pre meeting conversation. As Pastor Gene mentioned, you're sitting at the chair, you, you're not getting up. So if your board or your tellers, they go, oh, this was a unanimous decision, we throw away the ballots, or we didn't take care of them properly, or we mixed them together. Um, if you don't have that conversation pre-meeting, then the post-meeting actions cannot take place. So please be sure that that you're doing that. Um, any any other questions? Anything? I think we did cover most of the questions that were sent in. I'm going to read through those. Any questions right now that you guys have about ending the meeting or anything that you heard today? Pastor uh, Sean, um, are we able to videotape and record these, you know, meetings? Uh, Pastor Gene, I, I would let that let you answer that one. That depends on the state that you're in. Some states require one person to know about a recording. Some states require more than one. Um, <clears throat> we record them at district council just because it's easier to make the minutes from the recording. So the best rule of thumb is if you are recording. Uh, you have uh, you have an obligation to tell people that you know what I'm saying. We're we're recording the minutes for for uh, recording the meeting to make accurate minutes um, and those kind of things. And then those recordings, you know, I know that I introduced a motion. The press director became soup that not only we reform we inform everybody, but that within 30 days those uh, need to be destroyed. Those those audio recordings. One question that was asked again on here, and we kind of covered this a little bit, but um, are are you do you have to allow time for questions? 
Um, and I mean, again, you're, you're probably shooting yourself in the foot. If you don't allow those times, you're creating a secrecy that, that doesn't need to be there. Um, and in this answer here is, is Pastor Gene just said simply, you, you must allow those times as long as they're in order. You know, if the question is out of order, then you as the chairperson um, needs to address that. And Gina, you asked that question as well, kind of in a different way of, you know, what if I'm the chair here and, and, and an unruly person or a question comes up that they're trying to come against your authority? How do you handle that? I think a lot of this stems from, you know, this other questions that were brought up about this would be my first time chairing a meeting. And remember, uh, you've been you've been appointed by God to be in that role, to be in that position. And so you don't stand on your own authority. You stand on the authority of God. He's called you and he's placed you in that role when you get there. And, and so just rely on that. Rely on the Holy Spirit. Even though we said it's not a sermon, well, the Holy Spirit is just as much a part of your business meeting as he is a part of your sermons. And, and that's where prayer and preparation come into place. Read the books, know your bylaws, go in there with the confidence, Gina, that, that you can you can field any question that, that's coming your way. And, and if there is an issue where you're not understanding the, 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 the Robert's Rules of Order, that's where parliamentarians are behind you, right? And, and you can turn to those and kind of utilize that. Pastor Gene, how do we do that without looking like we don't know or you know, without looking foolish? What's the best way to go about that? I think you just need to not care about how you look because the goal isn't to look good. The goal is to have a, uh, an appropriate business meeting. And there's nothing wrong with asking, you know, Sean, I, uh, I have extensive training in parliamentary procedure. There's still times I forget things. I mean, chairing a meeting is different than being a parliamentarian. Um, parliamentarians are not supposed to speak unless they're asked. They're not even supposed to address the membership. They're there to serve the chairman, not not the body. So they're there as your counselors. Um, most church meetings, you don't need it. But if you get into other things, you you do make sure they're close enough for you to lean back in your chair and them to, to whisper uh, or give you advice and those, and those kinds of things. There are times I have forgotten about a certain ballot, times I've forgotten about giving a report, and that my team around me will remind me. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you want them to do it in a way that doesn't diminish people's confidence in you. Yeah. Uh, you want them to do it discreetly. So don't be afraid to, to ask and accept help. Any final questions? Any final thoughts? Well, let me close with, let me close with this. My last pitch to you, uh, those of you that are in this meeting. Why is parliamentary procedure important? Um, it provides fair treatment for all people. There's no good old boy club with parliamentary procedure. Everyone has the same rights. Uh, it saves a ton of time because there's structure. You're dealing with one thing at a time. Uh, it, uh, it, it also maintains order. The most dominant personality is not driving the meeting. Rights, duties, process is driving the meeting. It protects the rights of the majority that decide the way some should go. It also protects the minority and allows for them to be heard. Sean talked about you should you should uh, in every motion you say, "Are there any questions? Are we ready to vote?" These kinds of things, and it protects those who aren't there, which is very important. Um, you know, though they still have rights if they're members, even if they're not at that meeting. Uh, it protects the rights of all the members. It protects the rights of, as I said, absentees. But it it also helps people know the meeting is being governed not by your preference as the pastor or the chairman, not by your likes or dislikes, but by process that is fair for all. And it, it creates meetings that people want to attend. They know this is not gonna drag on and on, okay? Well, listen, thank you guys. And I uh, appreciate the questions that you sent. Uh, we used to deal with this in the board session and now the business meeting is separate. So all of you, and I mean this, you know more right now, as insecure as you feel, whenever you get information and you get empowered, you feel insecure because you're realizing, oh my gosh, I haven't been doing this, this, and this. You know more right now than probably 80% of pastors. Uh, I talked to a pastor a couple of weeks ago, has not had a business meeting in three years. 
and their bylaws require it annually. So uh, don't get discouraged You all, with what you have today. You're going to do great. All right. Well, listen, uh, I am going to ask Jared if he will close us in prayer, and then uh, we'll see you guys all next week for your last session before we honor you at Network Council. Yeah, Father God, thank you so much for this time that we had together. We just uh, we pray that we can apply this to our lives, Lord, that we can grow as leaders and pastors. God, thank you so much for uh, Pastor Gene and Pastor Sean and their time that they give and pouring into us and giving all these resources, Lord. We do. We want to be effective ministers and pastors for you, Lord. We want to keep things legal and ethical, and we just want to bring you glory and to be effective in your church, Lord. Again, thank you so much for this day. We bless your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen.